Welcome to One Big Idea. I'm Rob McIntyre. I'm the president of Worldwide Children's Fund and Sunday Line Communications. We seek to help organizations who are serving children in the poorest or most difficult circumstances in our world. We work with organizations in the Philippines, Israel, Ukraine, Africa, India, and here in Canada in Surrey, BC. We're a small organization local to the Vancouver area. One of the ways you can help us is when you see posts that we do on social media, please share it with your contacts, with your friends. Social media is a strange thing. You can post and post and post and post, but if your friends never share, you end up basically talking to the same people all the time. Now, we love talking to you, but we would like to talk to more people who may have an interest in what we're doing. Please help us by sharing our posts with your contacts, with your friends, uh, with the people you know. Now, one big idea. What is that? Well, each week I provide two things. I give a brief report on one of our partners or provide comment or history on one of our partners. Uh, then I give you one big idea. The big idea is biblical and it focuses on a particular topic. Right now I'm focusing on the church. So for the next several weeks I will give you one big idea about the church. First the partner update. Last week I introduced Prem Suwa. Prem Suwa Shikshan Sang is the Indian name of an educational organization in Nagpur, India. The name means Ministry of Love Education Society. They've been operating in Nagpur since 1981. When they started, their property was nothing but barren land. The Nagpur location now has a junior college with classrooms, dormitories, kitchen, and administrative buildings. Prem Suwa has a similar second facility located in Manjari, exclusively for girls. Today, 450 boys and 600 girls receive life-changing education and a caring home environment. The founder, Frank Ulich, did not start out with the idea of looking after hundreds of children. When he first went to India, he was a young man looking for adventure and exotic locales. India stayed with him. Later in life, after a Christian conversion experience, he returned to India with the idea of translating the Jewish and Christian scriptures into a particular Indian dialect. That was the start. Frank and another missionary type set settled in Nagpur, but it was not to be. The translation organization decided to leave India, and Frank was forced to leave as well. He went through a dark time, wondering if he would ever return to the place that his heart longed for. He returned to Nagpur in 1976 as an independent missionary, with the idea that he would pursue his translation work with no organization to back him. As Frank relates in his autobiography, the here I am, send me, sounds differently at a lonely ra railway station far away from home than it did in the comfort of a church community or a Bible college. In 1977, the kids started to come. Some from the tribal group that the translation effort was aimed at, others came from nearby slums, then from nearby towns and even neighboring states. This started when the three roommates got tired of doing housework. How familiar does that sound? Some were hired as household helpers and others were brought in, brought in order to help with their education. Soon the group multiplied from two to four to fifteen. Eventually, pressure from the landlord and other issues forced them to find a more suitable location. This led them to the purchase of land, which is their current location. Frank says it always jars him when people ask, how many kids are in your project now? His answer is, I have no project, therefore I have no kids in my project. I have a family, I have a home, and the kids are my kids, not charity cases. Our family is slightly larger than most families, but that makes no difference. 
I have known Frank Ulich and admired his work for many years. He, his was one of the first groups that we began to support during the television and radio years. He visited us regularly and was interviewed about his growing work and many adventures many times. It's not just education and food that is being provided to these children. It is care, values, morals, of, models of integrity, and of course, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fruit of this has been demonstrated for years. Frank, Bapu, and Johan are friends that I know and trust. This is an incredible work that deserves support. So now for the big idea. We're talking about the church. In the past, I spoke about the universal church, sometimes called the invisible church. Everyone who has truly placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted him for forgiveness of sins and eternal life belongs to this church. It transcends denominations and organizations. Last week, I took up the idea that God is the initiator. He is the creator of the church. The church belongs to God. Today, I want to address terminology. The word church is a charged word. Depending on who hears it, it may evoke feelings of warm affection or anger. It all depends on one's experience in or with the church. For some, the word church connotes the idea of irrelevant ideas and a caricature picture of some dated organization. Some folks think of stained glass and masses and chants. Others think of mass gatherings that seem more like concerts with motivational speakers. Some think of simple, small groups with deep devotion. Some go to the idea of weird practices and strange doctrines. And maybe church, for some means, religious arguments, fights, and fanatics. What you think of when you hear the word church is largely dependent on your upbringing and your experience. I want to take you back to the beginning. In the Christian scriptures, the idea of church is nothing like our current conception. It carries none of the connotations. It is based on the Greek word ekklesia. We get our word ecclesiastical from it. Ecclesia is a compound word. It is made up of the Greek word ek, which means out, and the word kaleo, which means to call. So essentially, the ecclesia means those who are called out. The word's origins are not religious in particular, they're more civic. Something happened and the citizens or those in positions of responsibility received a call to assemble or come together. So the basic idea of the word is assembly, and it is still sometimes translated that way. Remember, the primitive church did not have cathedrals and administrative offices and lots of structure. They met together. Certainly there were leaders and the leadership structure of sorts, but by comparison the church of, with the church organizations of today, it was quite dynamic. The early church was what we would call a grassroots movement. When we go back to the roots of the word, we see how it is used in relation to the church. From the standpoint of salvation, God has called individuals and they have responded to his call. He is always the initiator. So all those who have answered the salvation call of God can be said to have been called out. They are a part of this worldwide assembly of everyone who belongs to God. When we look at the roots of the word in relation to local church gatherings, we see essentially the same concept. We are a local people who are called by God, gathering to worship and to serve God. So the local church is a small part of the larger spiritual entity which is called together to worship and serve God. This idea of being called out carries with it a clear sense of purpose. It is connected with the idea that the church has a function apart from just being. 
the ideas connected with purpose are plain in the scriptures, in the Christian scriptures. First, we are, of course, worshipers of God, and we promote the worship of God. Second, Jesus provided us with explicit commands concerning our purpose. There should be no doubt in any Christian's mind. In Luke 24, 46 to 49, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed from power on high. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 7, 8, the continuation of Luke's writings, Jesus says to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In John 17, 18, Jesus prays to the Father concerning the church. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And then later in John 20, 21, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I could provide more statements from Jesus and the, the apostles, but I'm sure that you get it. Jesus told his disciples that they would now be the ones who would reveal the character and the heart of God to the world. The purpose for every follower of Jesus is to spread the good news about salvation through Jesus Christ everywhere to everyone. As you go, as you will go about your day-to-day -day business, as you go, spread the message of God's love and forgiveness of sins through the Lord Jesus Christ. Priority number one, period, far above anything else. God bless you.